Well, thank you very much, Teddy Cruz, for showing us the many ways in which urban design and building design really are central to justice in, in our cities. We can envision physically affordability, we can envision mixed use, we can envision an urban design that allows an accessible life for people of low or moderate means. As Teddy also explained, our designs are, exist in an environment of, and affect, are affect and are affected by an environment of policies and an environment of institutions. So in many ways, what we're able to design physically in terms of our cities, the kinds of justice or injustice that we're able to design into our cities is a function of our policies. And our policies are a function of a deeper phenomenon, the deeper phenomenon of our institutions that generate our policies. And it's those institutions that I want to talk about today. Uh, certain institutional designs, I'm going to argue, inherently work against the just city. And I'm also going to argue that the institutional designs that pervade planning in the metropolitan regions of the United States of America are some of those inherently unjust designs, institutional designs, that work against the kind of solutions that many of us would like to, would like to imagine. Uh, ultimately, significant progress is going to be on the, on the front both of physical design and on the front of institutional design. In order to explain what I mean by this, I'd like to put forward two fundamental principles. First off, when we're talking about uh, affordability, housing affordability, we're not merely talking about the affordability of the structure. We have to think about affordable living, not, not just affordable housing. Affordable living has everything to do with accessibility. Are you able to get to what you need to get to within a reasonable time and money expenditure? Uh, I'm going to bring somebody that I don't usually quote, and that's uh, Jack Kemp, the uh, now deceased former uh, uh, co uh, conservative, former uh, HUD secretary under George H.W. Bush, because nobody expressed this idea of the centrality of affordable living as opposed to merely affordable housing better than he did uh, as a result of exclusionary, discriminatory, and unnecessary regulations. Many lower income young families cannot find housing near, and I'm emphasizing the proximity here, near their places of work. And elderly couples cannot afford to live close to their children. It's not just about the structure, it's about the structure in an environment that gives people access to the ordinary needs of an ordinary day. Uh, but now we're in a bind because if, it's, if proximity matters so much, how is it that we can arrange our cities such that we have a combination of affordability and proximity? Well, there is a solution and it's the solution throughout the history of civilization and urbanization and that's a solution that expensive land is rendered affordable through the intervening variable of density. In fact, this is inherent to how cities have grown. Cities start out as low density settlements and then over the years and over the centuries, they, they grow both in footprint, they grow, grow in area and they grow up. I want you, I want you to ask yourself uh, what would happen in Berlin or Philadelphia or Buenos Aires or I could have taken any of the great cities of the world. If we had imposed upon these cities the assumption that guide the development of US metropolitan areas today. And that assumption is the assumption that once an area develops, particularly as it develops as a single family area protected by the single family zone, and that accounts for about two thirds of the territory, of our metropolitan areas, could any of these cities have arisen? Well, the clear answer is no, because the, the way we regulate land use currently is, would have short-circuited the ordinary processes of civilization and urbanization. It would have forced these cities to adopt a much more sprawling profile, a much less accessible profile because it would have given fewer people the opportunity to live near the destinations, as Jack Kemp said, their, their families and their children and their jobs, 
uh, that they need to get to. Uh, I'd like to offer as contrast to these historical examples current American suburbia. And this, this is not just any suburbia that I'm showing here. This happens to be uh, Sunnyvale, California, the heart of the Silicon Valley. I bring this particular example for a particular reason. This neighborhood developed in the early 60s before the term Silicon Valley was even coined. It developed as the far fringes of the San Francisco Bay Area. In the meantime, the area tr transformed into the global center of the high-tech industry. One can't imagine a more fundamental uh, urban transformation than that. Yet through that process from the 1960s to the year 2010, the physical form of this neighborhood remained unchanged. And it will remain unchanged, and here I am going to make a prediction, uh, it will remain unchanged into the foreseeable future and even beyond because our presumption is once we develop a neighborhood like this, it's not supposed to develop into anything else. The connection with, er, with justice is clear. When I look at a neighborhood like this, I look, I, I look at the missed potential for densifying redevelopment right cheek by jowl with, this, with the heart of Silicon Valley. And I think of all the households who aren't able to live near their jobs and commute in from 50, 60, 70 miles away in their search of affordable housing. Now, I promised, though, a story not about physical form. I promised a story about institutions. And I made the assertion that in the United States, our institutions systematically work against social justice. And we have it designed right into the fabric of how we do urban planning in the United States. Uh, to, to start with, let me, let me uh, make the following uh, assertion. We are among the most decentralized planning regimes in the, United, in the world. What I mean by that is planning in the United States is focused at a municipal level, and municipal planning barely has any, uh, uh, owes, barely owes any deference to planning at any other level. We treat our municipalities as virtual sovereigns. The norm in the Western world is some degree of hierarchical planning where a authority at a, great, at a larger scale, such as a regional scale or metropolitan scale or provincial scale, has influence over local planning. What's the implications of this kind of planning in the United States and what's the connection with justice? I want to give you a, 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 a very, very um, stylized example. I want you to imagine a metropolitan region and a particular municipality in this region. Now I want you to imagine a proposal for a, a relatively accessible and relatively affordable uh, development, and this is a housing development that I'm considering in this municipality. In our planning regime in the United States, the, fund, the final word over, over whether this development occurs really occurs at the municipality. So I want you to imagine that this, is, that this is more affordable than its surroundings. I want you to imagine that it's denser than its surroundings. And ultimately, what we're talking about is a process that's very akin to the processes that led to Berlin or Buenos Aires or Philadelphia. But in our American way of doing things, we say, well, do we allow this process of densifying redevelopment to allow an accessible lifestyle, to take our expensive land and cut it up into more affordable bits? Do we allow it to happen? Well, it's a political process, and we've got some opponents to this development. Now, note what I've done here is I've drawn our opponents more clustered around the developments than dispersed. The reason is that we perceive the developments, these developments, to exert a negative influence on their surroundings. It's a negative influence perceived of in terms of environmental quality. Frequently, it's talked about in terms of congestion on the roads or overcrowding in the schools. Uh, it's often talked about about the fiscal base of the, of the municipality. What's not talked about anymore, but that doesn't mean that it's absent, is the racial dimension where we're concerned about people of different races living near us in our communities. So for all these reasons, one might expect that the, that the opponents of such a development are going to be more clustered than the proponents, who might be a little bit more scattered. Now what I want you to ask you to do is I want you to imagine yourself as a politician. 
You're a politician, of maybe a city council member from, from this particular municipality, and you look at the opponents and you look at, look at the proponents, but the very simple principle of the clustering of the opponents and the scattering of the proponents of this degree, of this um, development, leads you to oppose the development. This is very, very common in American planning. We use our land use regulatory power to exclude or to zone out these kind of developments or to reduce their number or reduce their scale or reduce their density. It's built into our system when we vest the final word at the municipality. In, by contrast, I want to ima now imagine yourself as a politician and you're a politician in a different regime. You're a politician at the metropolitan scale. And you scan the territory of opponents and proponents of a development like this. And you note that there are both. And you note that there are, that, uh, well, I've drawn it as roughly equal in number. That's pretty convenient for my particular argument. But the, the scattering of the proponents probably comes from the fact that one, one might view that the development is positive because that person is anti-sprawl, and the other might develop the, uh, view the uh, development as positive because that person is pro-affordable housing. Mother, another person might like it simply because they want to live there. All sorts of reasons for supporting the development. Point is, at the metropolitan scale, we can, con we can conceive of coalitions that can support this kind of densifying redevelopment that give more people the opportunity to live in a close live a close in and accessible lifestyle we can conceive of these opportunities at the metropolitan scale these coalitions at the metropolitan scale that are much much more difficult to conceive of when we're talking about at the municipal scale so for this reason i argue that our localist planning is inherently biased against the kind of of a progressive uh, justice-based solutions that people in this room and, and my very distinguished fellow panelists might, might uh, propose. In an environment like that, I would say that progress depends not only on improvements in our physical design, it, it depends on improvements in our institutional design as well. These improvements can be incremental, these inc improvements can be more fundamental. Now, I don't know, I'm going to pick up on something that Monica uh, attributed to me correctly. I don't know what the future of urbanism is. I do have a principle, however. Uh, forca forecasts about the future usually reveal more about the value set of the forecaster than they do about the future per se. Prognostications are often best understood as normative statements about the desirable future. For that reason, I'd like to be explicit. I'm not going to conclude with a forecast but I will conclude with a prescription. We Americans ven venerate the local with romantic language like government that's closest to the people. But equity in design, in physical design, is gonna entail balancing that goal with institutional reform, ensuring that constituencies beyond the municipal boundaries are adequately represented in planning decisions, including those pertaining to land use. Now, I don't know that this shift from the U.S. version of extreme localism and planning to greater regionalism or regional authority will ever come about. And I also don't view it as a sufficient condition for, for greater equity. Uh, but without this kind of fundamental institutional reform, physical design for equity will need to constantly fight an uphill battle in the thousands of municipalities that form the metropolitan regions of the United States. Thank you.